When you saw the videotape at my house of yourself uh, at that time, you didn't want to look at it? No. How did you feel when you looked at that child? Well, you see, I'm more mature now. And uh, I have, you know, more discipline in my life. And I see a little, you know, a wild kid that was there that, you know, that's changed and mellowed out over the course of the years. They tried to take over one of my division, but uh, they didn't quite make it, and we killed two of their guys. They tried to burn down my clubhouse. We killed two of their guys, and five of their guys rolled up on one of the savage nomads. You know what they told them? Oh, we're going to give you hell, baby. We're going to give you hell. And they didn't even kill them. Back then, I had left my home. I was gone from my house for a couple of years. I was running in the streets. We made a family, all right, to substitute for what every one of us had left. We weren't accepted. We used to blow people's minds, you know what I'm saying, with the stuff we used to do because we knew that we weren't accepted. Ah, I'm Benji. They call me Black, Black Benji. Black Benji, man. Black yeah, Benji. Black Benji, Black president ben. of Savage Nomads. Yay. Yeah, where do you come from? St. Thomas. All over. How long have you been here? Ah, uh, for about uh, 16 years. A savage now <laughs> nomads no, tough gang? Very so. Yeah, well, Very much so. How about you? What's your name? Blackie. Blackie? And what's the name of your guy? Savage Skull. Savage Skull. Any of the guys belong to both groups? Nah, we're just two different clicks. It's the same. It's one click, but two different names. Do you help each other out? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Like, we went to go down against these bachelors, bachelors, and they didn't show up, so we had to go down their way. And, like, they still didn't show up. They was hiding out, you know, they were scared. It's the regular punk thing, you know? You know, after we came back, the cops tried to bust a couple of the guys, you know? But then we all stuck up, you know, and we threw a couple of gas bombs at them just to make it look good, you know? And so they started panicking and whatnot, and so they let the guys go. And so then Blackie went up to them with a, he had a gun on him, they didn't want to serve They knew he was packing the pieces, big old 38 Magnum sticking up. Like, they want to make it a racial problem, you know? So we didn't want that, you know? So I jumped in, I put him for my boy, because he's a black brother, you know? So we made an unracial problem. Everything came down, man. In these neighborhoods, in fact, like where we are now, there was always uh, groups that protected their community. You know, uh, it was very territorial. The Savage Skulls lived in this area. The Ghetto Brothers lived in this area. Uh, it, you know, it just it sprouted up as a sort of like a defense for the particular communities. Suppose, like, we go into a room, but right, we clean the, you know, because you know, we have somebody else packing. But about five of us are standing around the corner, right? They arrest us for unlawful assembly because they know something's getting ready to jump off. So like, uh, you know, they just arrest us to try to avoid the shit, right? So now suppose you with your family, you got ten people in your family, right? I got nine in my family. Suppose we stand on the corner, you know, you should arrest them too. But now, nah, why should they, they just picking on us and shit? Uh, they must not like us. Why do you think they don't like you? Because we find cut sleeves. Is that what you call colors now? Cut sleeves? No, I mean, like, if they see anybody with cut sleeves, he's in a gang, he's in a club, he's this, you know, he's a, he's, you know, menace to society. So I thought about it. I was talking to my son the other night, and he was saying Ben was always like family. And I said to you the other night, how long has it been? How long was it that we didn't see each other? 1973? From 7 February 73. February. Until... October? Two, yeah. 89. 1989. What did we mean to you? 16 years ago, you were a child. How did you perceive us? You accepted us. You gave us a lot of things that we didn't, you know, 
know what I'm saying? What we left the house that, you know what I'm saying? What we didn't have there. You gave. What did we give you? What? Acceptance, love, you know, trust, goals, Manny, you know, as a teacher, yourself as a teacher, you came up to the Bronx, trusted us, you gave us, you know, hope. teaching job in New York City was in the South Bronx. I took the subway and later the L to the Bronx and I walked down the deep stairs into the most devastated community I'd ever seen in my life. I got a note from a parent asking me to excuse an absence because the child had no shoes. There were constant fires in the community. Whenever I asked children to paint pictures of their block, there was always a fire engine a building burning down. There were always garbage cans with people standing around them, warming their hands over the fires. I began to make the tapes in 1969 because I realized nobody knew anything about the home lives of the children they were teaching. So I thought that because I had the ability to get close to people, and because I was close to some of the kids who were out in the streets, that I would be able to explain to teachers why the educational system failed to meet the needs of certain more independent and very bright students. You married? No. You go to school? No. You got a good education? Yes. How? And so what grade did you finish? I went up to the ninth College. grade. Oh, that's, that's, not, good. Good. that's not good. That's wait, not good. That's wait. not good. But I bet you, my wow. level, my IQ is higher than all three of y'all put yeah. together. Yeah, okay. Why did I quit school? Why? I got locked up, right? And after I came out, I tried to get back into school, you know? And so they said, all right, I went into Morris. They said, okay, you got to shut up. It was night school. I was working. Excuse me. Let finish talking. I was working at the time, so I had to go to night school. See, I made an effort. On my part. And so I tried to go back to school and shit, but they said I had to get my old day school record. So when I went back to Clinton, I was lying down on the staircase outside of Clinton on the main entrance because it was real hot on the inside. And so then the school cop came out. He took me inside and tried to arrest me. And so I had to try to explain to him, but he didn't want to listen. So then when I asked the dean, the dean knew that you know, I had a purpose for being there, but the cop called him over to the corner and told him they was going to run a little game. You know. like he probably needed a bust or something. <laughs> and so, you know, he, he busted me. Ever since then, I haven't gone back to school, you know, because yeah. uh, I had to use a false name because, hey, what, my, what was my highest grade? 99s, 98s, 97s, and my, le my least Nine, was an 85. Ten. Same with me. Same. Yeah, I was pretty strong willed when I was in school. I was, you know, above average. I was in a college bond program in that school. I was outspoken. I wasn't given to accept everything that, you know, they gave to me. You wouldn't like them if somebody turned around and you had a family and they they struck at you or they struck at your family. Well, if I knew you I was going to take that, that if I knew I was going to take that chance, chance I, wouldn't, right I wouldn't have a family. I won't get a family. Right now. You're taking the chance with your own life. Hey, yo, some people, somebody tried to take my life already. He blew his chance and I took his life. Now he's sorry. You only have one life. And so how did the people in uh, the neighborhood around you regard uh, the savage nomads? Those that knew us that we had to interact with, they loved us. We used to get up in the mornings, go to their house, drink coffee, eat. They used to bring us food during the day, during the evenings, you know? Those who didn't know us, they saw different people and, you know, we really didn't care. And we used to do things that we, you know, show them that we didn't care. So they didn't like us, they didn't accept us, you know? Now I'm cutting out because I ain't cutting out no place. I'm going to court tomorrow. And like I'm going for sentencing, and I don't think I'll be back. How long do you think you'll be away? I don't know. For these, I got a gun size, man. I like, they waiting for the ballistic test come back. 
to find out, you know, if it has a homicide. If ballistic bring it back and it's hot, and it's going to go to the Supreme. So far, the lawyer kept it down in criminal. Now, that's good, you know, for a gun charge. You know how, you know, guns being busted with guns. It's bad nowadays. But when you went upstate, you told me that you became involved in legal activities there. Well, you know, I was in, uh, I considered myself in a lot of trouble legally. You know, you know what I'm saying? I was, Cindy, you look back. Okay. I was, you know, I wanted to assist in my defense. I was assisting in my defense. And I was going to the law library. They would give me cases and citations and, you know, so I got real familiar, and I got, you know, I, I, I realized that if I was going to get out of jail, that's what I'd really have to, you know, really get deeply involved in the law. So what is that? Talking. That's, that's uh, lemon juice. You have to put it in water and put sugar to make lemonade. Drink the milk. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I started giving those courses. You know, I got so. Oh, I gave the courses in Attica, Comstock, Sing Sing, uh, Green Haven, a couple of different you know prisons. Everyone, everywhere I used to go, you know, the reputation preceded me. I was real good, and I went what right to the law. What kind of reputation? Like a, reputation as a what? jailhouse lawyer. I uh -huh. used to represent people. A lot of people in jail. Not as a I, savage nomad president. No, not as a uh, you know. But they, everybody knew me. It's a small community. Everybody, oh, that's Benji. Yeah, yeah. No, you need this. Go ask Benji. You know, Benji has a good heart, but he did a few little things every now and then. I met him. He was riding on a motorcycle. And he started this division called No Man's on Wheels. You know, and I was like, wow. You know, and they had boots, and they had the savage nomad colors, and they were riding on the motorcycles and all this. And he picked me up in high school and, and um, on a motorcycle. So I was like, well, I ride on your motorcycle, but I gotta take off my colors. I'm still a turban. Can't be riding on a motorcycle with these colors. See, when, when I got into the turbans that I was in junior high school, we used to like, they had the clubhouse. It was more of hanging out and going down there, listening to music and things like that. So it was, you know, and, and all the guys were like older. They weren't guys that were 13, 14, 15. They were guys that really came out of Vietnam. They were all like ex-soldiers. Chino told me, do you want to start a, a division for girls? And we had girls already hanging out in the club. So I said, okay, as long as we get a jacket. So he said, sure, you get a jacket. So, you know, I, I told girls, you want to be turbans? You want to be turbans? It started out like that. Like, we really didn't want to, you know, go into war with anybody because of the colors. But it did, it did at times, it did happen. The javelins were two blocks away from us on Hoa Avenue. And the javelins, the attitude was, you know, you got your t uh, a turban, you can't walk down this block. So that's like when they took my colors when I went to visit my grandmother. I said, okay, I gave them my jacket, and that was resolved. The presidents went over there and said, give her back her jacket, and we're going to rumble. In a way, it was a political game, but at the same time, if you mess with them, the guns came out. While well, other gangs at that time still had bats and chains. No, they didn't have no bats and chains. They had 32s, 38s. Uh, so we were in question where they got the guns from because it was very rare that there was a rumble in the Turbans Club. You know, they weren't into rumbling yet. And they weren't into the, the jackets. They were into dressing nice and having a lot of, lot of buttons and looking more political. You know, then the rest of the guys, I, I never thought I would be a nomad. I said, oh, it's nomads, it's Savage girls, and the way they look and the way they dress. Like in myself. We went to school together. We went to 52. And we had a relationship from then, from school days, throughout uh, the gang days, and until now. The Savage Skulls, their club, used to be where this lot, where these guys are standing. Their club used to be right there. I got shot right in there. That's where Blackie had this club. You know, that was the first division of the Savage Skulls. This is where our old clubhouse used to be at. And now, it's, uh, it's, as you can see, uh, 
automotive place. We are close to 25 divisions spread out through all the boroughs. It started out as just personal group hanging, you know, just friends hanging out, and then it got big. And it was just like a family. But then the police started harassing and it made it get out of hand. And so then, it, within the anger, everybody turned to crime. They, they, were, they were always accused of. Well, if we're gonna get accused of this, well, we're gonna do it anyway. So no matter what we do, whether we do it right or we do it wrong, they're gonna blame us, so we did it anyway. The club got messed up when I got locked up. Everybody that tried to take over the club could not handle it. But you see, Blackie, it takes a certain charisma. I mean, this guy had hundreds of people, you know, who respected him, who would listen to what he had to say, who would be, you know, in total chaos. But when he walked into the room, it was quiet and the press is here and we got to listen. And it takes something to be able to have that control. I was never, never officially a Savage Skull. Never. I never wore colors and I never wore a jacket that said property of or anything. But just the fact that I was Blackie's girl, I was a Savage Skull. You understand? And if they went out and had a fight and somebody got killed, I was part of that too. I did every gang activity you can think of. You know, if there was weapons to be carried, I did it. I was an alcoholic when I was like 14 years old. Uh, I'd get up at 7 o'clock in the morning and I'd go out there and hustle the quarters in the corner so I can, you know, have my bottle of wine. My son is 16 years old now. When I had him, I was still a little bit, you know, out in the street. Uh, Blackie was incarcerated, so I was out here by myself. Oh, God. Who's that? That's me. That's you? The Chena was still the Chena that you see sitting here. I was never into drugs. I was never into going out there and beating up girls just because they're walking down the block and they're walking down my turf and they're wearing colors. But like I said, it was rough because, you know, I did get shot. And that wasn't an easy thing for me to get shot and get a scar on my body, especially from the Dirty Dozen. I went to the Skulls Club and there was a whole thing. They got hit on. They said that they thought I was a guy. They just saw my colors and they thought they saw Savage Norman, so they shot me. I don't know. I would never wish that now on anybody to go through things like that. You know, I would never um, want my son to be in a gang and and then, you know, have to get initiated and have to get kicked and punched and beat up just to be in a gang. Or if he did something wrong, they would do it to you too. I went to prison and I tell you I had to go through this program, uh, a violence program in there. They claimed that uh, delinquency was caused by people, by uh, people, men or women, boys, girls, young people, old people, whatever, whoever, whatever the criminal element, they uh, lost they uh, lost their bond with society. You know, you have to look at where these kids come from, why they do the things they do. It, it, you know, you just don't, it, I, I don't know how I can get my point across, but you just don't get up in the morning and say, well, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. I'm gonna land up in jail for the rest of my life. I'm gonna shoot up drugs. No, I think I'll join a gang. Or maybe I'll just prostitute. Or better yet, I'll be a, a, a pimp or, you know, or I'll be a thief. You don't get up and do it. Vita, do you remember Tony? Little Tony, he was uh, he was uh, one of our Roman kings, and then his brother Joey, Joe, Big Joe, he took over the Savage Nomads from once Benji got locked up. Joe comes from a family of four brothers and one sister. So far, out of all those brothers, only one is left. So okay, all of them have been shot. Um, the sister died of a drug overdose. And see, this whole family here of four brothers and one sister come from a family where their mother, she was a gang member too. So I think that just surviving has to do with your family influence, okay? Because if your mother's in the gang and then you're in the gang and everybody's in the gang and eventually you're out there doing things which you're not supposed to do, they all wind up in jail. I was living in PR, I was five years old. My father had killed himself. 
Okay, all I had was my grandmother. I didn't know my mother from Adam. One day I'm in school, you know, on the recreational period, and this lady comes up to me, just snatches me out of the yard, and she says, you're coming with me, I'm your mother. I said, you're not my mother, you know, my mother's home, you know, I'm talking about my grandmother. Next thing you know, I'm over here in New York. Don't know what's going on here. They put me in a school where I don't even know English, and that was it. About six months later, I was out on the streets. I was running away left and right. When I was up to eight years old, I was already out in the streets. And from there, I just went and did everything on my own. Tuvo sus problemitas, mm -hmm. pero salió bien. Me daba muchos problemas cuando era joven porque se descarrió como las ovejas. Cuando tenía como unos 13 años así, comenzó a irse de la casa, a tener mala compañía. Entonces yo me tiraba detrás de él a buscarlo. Cuando yo me cogía coraje le daba duro, duro. Sí, le daba duro, ¿verdad? Yeah, with a black bag. <laughs> sí, yeah, yeah, the black bag right there. Ay, Dios mío, me ponía frenética. A él le pegaron dos tiros. Sí. sí, a él, él le dieron dos tiros, una otra ganga. Sí. Él, él precisamente ese día estaba en casa él. Y entonces yo le aconsejé que no se fuera, pero él, él se tiró y se fue. Y cuando yo vine a saber, él estaba en el hospital. Uh -huh. Yo vine a ver qué pasaba, le habían dado dos tiros. Sí. Y mataron dos, mataron dos. Sí. Y dieron una señora que ella murió. Y los otros los mataron en el acto. Entonces Felipe fue al hospital, le sacaron una bala. Se le quedó una sí. adentro, pero después la devolvió. Las esperanzas que yo tenía era que él estudiara y que pudiera llegar a ser alguien en, la, en el mundo. ¿ves? Sí, y bueno, es lo que todas las madres queremos con los hijos. Sí. to get out of it. You have to know how to also grow. It's not just being in the gang and, 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 and after, and after your, your, your old man gets locked up, you know, you go crazy. That's get a girl. See, the ghetto girls are very political in a way. They did a lot of good things. Cleaning the streets, helping the, the kids with their homework. You know, they were into all this kind of a hippie thing too. You know, listening to their heavy metal and their Beatle albums and all this. The original concept of the Ghetto Brothers was really my brothers. Me, Robin, Victor, Raymond. was purely a brother thing. When you saw the videotape at my house of yourself uh, at that time, you didn't want to look at it? No. How did you feel when you looked at that child? Well, you see, I'm more mature now. And uh, I have, you know, more discipline in my life. And I see a little, you know, a wild kid that was there that, you know, has changed and mellowed out over the course of the years.
They tried to take over one of my division, but uh, they didn't quite make it, and we killed two of their guys. They tried to burn down my clubhouse. We killed two of their guys, their and five of their guys rolled up on one of the savage nomads. You know what they told them? Oh, we're going to give you hell, baby. We're going to give you hell. And they didn't even kill them. Back then, I had left my home. I was gone from my house for a couple of years. I was running in the streets. We made a family, all right, to substitute for what every one of us had left. We weren't accepted. We used to blow people's minds, you know what I'm saying, with the stuff we used to do because we knew that we weren't accepted. Brothers and sisters together in the living room, and then we would talk about the Bible. Later on, I, we got to be aware that he was teaching us Torah. And I said, Pa, it's interesting that we go to church on Sunday, and yet, isn't God's holy day on the Sabbath? He said, shh, don't talk about it. Found out uh, as, as I was getting older that a lot of this fear was passed down because of the Inquisition, it was passed down from family to family. But a lot of them remained with their customs about wearing a, a prayer shawl. My father never had a prayer shawl. He had a blanket, a white blanket. He, wrapped it all around him and he will go into a little room and if he didn't have a light on he'll have a little candle always with Tanakh in front of him but mainly reading from the from the books of Moses because he's Spanish he can walk out in the street if they talk to him he answers them in Spanish and the sign of his muscles is enough to get him in the community he has no conflict at all in the community but in his heart there is the sign. He has the conflict in his heart. He knows in his heart that he's a Jew. And therefore, this mask that he was wearing outside that get him along in the Spanish neighborhood, he sort of threw off when he got into head. I had colors, but the guys never knew anything about my religious beliefs, my religious backgrounds. Benji, even the guys found it peculiar that I never allow no members of the gang to wear German swastikas on their uniforms. Why are we supposed to be uh, uh, an outlaw gang? All of us, we got to look mean. We had the skulls with the swastikas. We never believed that. They never asked why. Some members were suspicious of Benji's too religious. They used to call me the preacher. Because there's a lot of clubs that help just their own friends. They forget about other people who live around us, you know? But we don't, we don't think like that. We like to help everybody. You know what? It was a dream that I've always wanted to be accomplished because I always uh, fantasized of becoming a leader of a great organization. But then I didn't realize that I, that I was the leader of a very uh, uh, gang that uh, caused a lot of destruction, a lot of hurt in people in the community. And as time went on, I started to see myself and say, wait, maybe we can channel all this negative energy into something very positive. We started to change our image from using our hands and hurting people to doing something constructive like fixing, uh, fixing people's cars, fixing people's apartments, painting people's apartments, helping people walking up the block. What's left of the old Ghetto Brother Club is still standing there. When I see that, I get shivers up my spine. Here's where all the major decisions were made during those violent years. We were the type of group that we were internationalized, okay? We believed that there was no boundary. The streets belonged to everybody. Now, the rules that the other gangs was, if you step in a certain community, you have to take off your colors. If you're walking with your colors, you're asking for war. You're not showing respect to this, uh, to this gang's uh, community. When Ghetto Brothers used to do that, we would actually take off our jackets, not to start any rumble. Um, before we even do that, I'll even talk to the president and let him know the relationship with the Ghetto Brothers doing the community. We were one of the only groups that they allow us to walk in their community with our colors on, because they knew we represented peace. Cornell Benjamin, also known in the streets as Black Benji, was ambassador for the Ghetto Brothers. He was beaten to death when he tried to intervene between two other gangs. Instead of retaliating, the Ghetto Brothers convened a peace meeting of all the gangs in the South Bronx at the Boys Club on Hoe Avenue. 
This event marked a turning point in the history of the gangs as they began to turn away from violence to become a positive force in the community. Black Benji was the third staff leader in the ghetto rooms. His job was to make peace with other clubs, bring in the presidents, the vice presidents, and the warlords to our division, let them know what the platform of the Ghetto Brothers is, what do we stand for, and what is our objectives. We started, we came down the stairs, right? And we stopped there. And there was about 13, you know, 13 to 20 of us. And then when we looked down, we seen them. That's when Benji came out, and Benji said, he, he took a step forward and he said, listen, brother, I'm here, we're here to talk peace. And uh, the guy, he came out and he said, I don't know, he said, piece of shit. And he like, must have took a jump. It looked like he threw a kick, but he must have took a jump to grab a pipe. Black Benji, at that time, was getting beat up right in the very corner. We found out an hour later, after he was taken to the old Lincoln Hospital, that they killed him. Oh, uh, there were three gangs involved. You had uh, 70 mortals, Black Spades, and the Mongols. And as a result of, that, of his death, that's where all the gangs met at the boys club. Pressing of the scene. Advise the ghetto brothers. Warlord of the ghetto brothers. Hey, I would like for the police to leave. Or we got, or we got nothing to say. We came to your turf, man, when Black Benji died, man. That's when we came to your turf for static, man. I'm going to tell you what's happening now, because all this shit is bullshit, man. You see, because like, wow, man, we didn't have no static with you people, man. All we did is ask you people for the colors, man, and you people didn't give us our colors back. When we have static, man, we settle out among ourselves, man, because like, wow, we got to live in this district. The whitey don't come down here, man, and live in the fucked up houses, man. The whitey don't come down here, man, and have all the fucked up fucking, no heat in the fucking with the time, you understand? We do, Jack. So therefore, like, wow, we got to make it a better place to live. You understand? Newspaper people will walk up to, what are you guys going to do? And here's how the media works, you know? And then he got members of my club and members of other gangs. Benji, what are you going to do? Are we going to take revenge of the death of Black Benji? I said, no, we're not. Would you believe that members are angry at me and some even threaten me? I said, to bring, to take revenge will make Benji's peace Oh no, it will mean nothing, we'll make it void. Even though we had colors, we were a gang, we'd never look for trouble, man. I could understand if they beat up Benji, but killing him is another thing. You took away one of our brother's lives, man. And we were right down at the funeral looking at him, saying, I wish the immortals, if they were them, to see what it is to take away one of our brother's lives. You don't want us to become a gang again, right? Because I know you, right? Don't I know you? You was up in the meeting and you told me, Benji, I want to get out alive. Didn't you tell me that? Benji didn't get out alive. Benji died. They took away my brother's life, man. The thing is, we're not a gang anymore. We're an organization. We want to help black and Puerto Ricans to live in a better environment. That's how a lot of gangs got together as a result of the death of, of a brother who went out to make peace and not war. Somebody brought it up, you know, as why nobody ever got together. A lot of people fail to realize the police, even though we used to fight against each other, sometimes those fights were caused by the police, because if we ever did band it together, all the clubs in the Bronx, sure. they would have a hard time. Black has got a point there. I've been visited by many times, by several times, FBI, police officers. They always say there was something up with the GB who was getting too political, the young lords were getting involved mm -hmm. with the gangs, the Black Panthers were getting involved with the gangs, and I was bringing a lot of this political influence into the Bronx. You guys, you remember what? We are being oppressed by the North American Yankee. We, the Puerto Ricans, should rise up and defend ourselves against these dogs who will oppress us and liberate our country from capitalism and imperialism. The North American is trying to steal our identity as Puerto Ricans and call us Americans. We Puerto Ricans are Puerto Ricans to the day we are born until the day we die. At that time, we had a lot of influences. Uh, we had you, your family. We had uh, the times. This was early 70s. It was a time of change. We had a lot of things coming at us. We wanted to change the social order. Remember when we first met Jose Torres and I, the first thing he asked us, he says, uh, so Benji, what do you represent? I said, well, we're the Ghetto Brothers. Said, is that a gang? I said, well, it was a gang. Now we're going to, we're changing ourselves in a political organization. He said, no. what do you guys believe in? Complete independence for Puerto Rico. 
He said, what affiliation are you with? I said, well, at that time it was called Movimiento por Independencia. That's correct. Juan Mare Bras. I said, we're connected with uh, Juan Mare Bras. We like this platform. And, and uh, I feel that the Ghetto Bros is going to fashion themselves after them. I met Oscar Colasso. I met uh, them, uh, Lolita Lebron. By the way, those are the, the two of the persons who uh, attacked the Blair House. And the House of Representatives. Yeah, that's right. And they in 51, that's in right. In 51. They shackled themselves into the baluster and they just started shooting. Vida Puerto Rico Libre, no hell broke loose. A strong woman to me was somebody like Lolita Lebron. Okay, because Lolita Lebron was from the Seven Nationalists, which was a political group that woke up in Puerto Rico. And I found her to be a good role model because she, she was, she was a mother, she was struggling, and she wanted her island to become something better. Okay, the children in the island, more education, more centers, more places for the kids. I used to go to Puerto Rico every summer. I stayed with my father, my grandmother, my sister. My sister graduated first from law school. I learned a lot from her and her crew from the college because she went to the University of Law and everybody there was like a nationalist. She was always for the freedom of Puerto Rico. So her thing was that Puerto Rico is an oppressed country because of the white man. Okay, because when they went over there, they bought a lot of farms off and they bought a lot of territory that belonged to the Puerto Ricans. Like, we had sugar fields, we don't have, it. We don't have them anymore. Because a lot of people sold their land to the Americans, which built hotels and condominiums. And then these people came to the United States thinking that they were very, very rich, which turned out to be the opposite. Once they got here, they found out their money didn't last long. They winded up in the ghettos, which we call barrio. And then finally, at the end, they, got, they had to go to public assistance. And my sister got to go to Cuba, and she met Castro. My father was against that. Over there, that's like being a rebel. My father is very Republican. And my sister, she was a nationalist, so he had a fit. In her room, she had a picture of Che Guevara, and she had another one, Abiso Campo, and you know. All these things, he just hated it. He just said, oh, put the picture somewhere where nobody sees them from the windows. There was no gang in this country that did more for us as Puerto Ricans and Hispanics than the young lords. My brother and I were thinking about who to become involved with we decided the Black Panther Party was more for us because of, because of the way they were confronting the issues. But then uh, the Young Lords had a confrontation in the church on, in, uh, on 111th Street, and that's when I really became more aware of the Young Lords. I liked a lot of the things that they were about. Uh, we were talking about Puerto Rican independence. They were talking about organizing Puerto Ricans here in this country. You know, and uh, a lot of the people that I spoke with, our experiences were similar in terms of, of racism, in terms of family upbringing, uh, in terms of being in tune with Puerto Rican culture. say if we're down here and I look up and I see this whole line this whole line of sad skulls and it was almost like you know one of these movies that I've seen you know where they, where they depict the Native Americans on their horses lined up you know suddenly and they're all they're all coming down this hill and they all start coming down towards where we were and, and they're like w walking in unison again and and again here's this feeling that's like I see, you know, like the reinforcements are here. You know, I was under the impression that this was happening for the first time. You know, but I was to find out later that the Young Laws had a lot of extensive connections with a lot of the different gangs, particularly here in the Bronx. At that time, the Young Lords were pretty active. They had uh, taken a, a X-ray truck. We used to watch the X-ray truck with my little switchblade, my little knife. What we did was that we, we took the TV truck and parked it in an area where it would be available to the large segment of the community. And the young lords and the, and the gang members, what we did it, we formed a human ring around the TV truck. 
they were supportive in situations where there was always a strong possibility that the police were going to, quote, vamp on us. Yeah, I think it was a great moment of education for Puerto Ricans as a whole here in, the, in New York. And I think that we mature unbelievably in those six or seven years that the young lords were very active. of the leadership of these gangs, which were always the ones who were targeted, you know, the leadership, because the feeling was if the leadership was taken out, that the rest of the gang would fall apart. A lot of them wound up in prison, you know. Imagine uh, some of the key people went to prison, some died, you know. Uh, some got married, you know. I know you got some gang members that have been married 20 years, you know, the same same person. They have kids. They're, they're, they're uh, 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 living as uh, what we call a... Uh, 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 outstanding members of the community. Because to me, they were outstanding members of the community back then. You might be rubbing shoulders walking by a person who was allegedly one of the most vicious leaders of the Savage Skulls or was the warlord, you know, of a man. You know, they're living somewhere near this area with three children, a wife, you know, uh, part of it which is supposed to be classified as the American dream. Uh, but they still have the same aspirations, you know. Did you go to school? Yeah, I, I finished high school and I went to college in there. You went to how, how long were you in prison? Uh, I did four years. I did two and a half and I did the other one out here, the last one out here. What were you studying? What? Uh, recreation, physical education. I've known a number of people who were rehabilitated inside the prison system. Really? That's extraordinary. Uh, I remember one of the survivors of the Attica massacre on WBAI one night saying, how the hell are we going to be rehabilitated when we ain't never been habilitated in the first place? And that's the difficulty. Psychiatrists say that if you're going to rehabilitate somebody, you've got to get them when they're still in the crib that early. And you know that most of the kids we're talking about certainly don't have access to that kind of medical consultation. I'm melancholy about the prospects for most of the kids. It frightens me. The case that you just cited, of course, I think is extraordinary. And probably very worthwhile. Work like the devil to salvage one or two. Once in a while, you know, when I go back to the past and want to go out there and keep on banging the heads. Serious? Yeah. So that's my problem right now, at this very point, right now. I'm hanging out too much. I'm starting to, you know... Well, I see a lot of the brothers are reuniting over here on Mount Eaton. Right. A lot of old savage snowmans that I know. Right. And maybe I get a flashback. I don't know what it is. I just want to go out there and hang out. He gets them flashbacks. You know, it became a lifestyle. To us, it became a lifestyle, the way we was living with the clubs, you know, and hanging out with the fellas. It became a lifestyle that a lot of people don't really understand. You know, that's why sometimes, you know, just like him, you know, sometimes I just feel like going out there, forget about working and keep hanging out. You know what I'm saying? But then again, you know, I got kids, you know, I got a responsibility and that, you know, it holds me back. But if there was none of that, man, a lot of us would be out there, mm. you know, doing the same thing because the way this system is doing for us, we're not getting nowhere. We was doing better when we was hanging out than we're doing now. Just because we, I was a gang member and you know that I would like to help, you know, help the kids in the community. You know, everywhere I went to seek help, after, I, after one year I had this little league team, it worked out so good that the next year, you know, every, all the parents were coming up to me. Yo, what are you gonna do for next year? I went seeking help to see, you know, nobody wanna do anything with me. Simply because, oh, he's the next gang member. Even to this day, a lot of people come to me, Black, you know, what do you want to do? You know, I should say, there's nothing I can do right now. There's a lot of centers being closed, and the kids are all hitting the streets. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of kids out there with problems, nobody doing anything. They don't want to help them out, but yet when they do something bad, they do something negative, they want to criticize them and down them all the way. Why not, you know, reach out and, you know, try to give them a helping hand? 
right now here in the side outside, you're missing two buildings, which was the city completely tore down because you know they felt it was easier. So now what they're doing instead of instead of uh, tearing them down, they're rebuilding them. I got the kids helping me to load up the the old beams so they can get cleared out, so the workers can have room to work. You know, so being that they got you know they're not doing anything but just hanging out, so I you know I bring them to help me out. And you know, they make some money too. My children and my nephews, keep them away from the streets, you know? Doing too much hanging out. And you know, get them used to working. I have in Puerto Rico, five brothers and sisters from one wife and my father has six from another. And all my sisters and brothers have one child. Because they came from a family of six, and at many times they didn't get the clothes they wanted. <laughs> you know, he wants a brother and sister. I said, oh, God. <laughs> so, you know, and I said, you have a brother and sister. You can't be asking me for $60 sneakers and bugle boy pants and things like that. But I gave him everything that he wants because he goes to school, and he likes his science class, his math class. He brings me back his grades that are good. I put him through Catholic school, where I paid his Catholic school. Okay, now he's going to apply for a special high school that he wants to go to for animal science. But I went to dental school and I was t studying dentistry. I guess some counselor. I don't know, you know these counselors, they try to push these courses on you. I guess that, that, that you know, they want more, more people in. And I was like, dentistry? That was really never me, you know what I mean? To be there all day looking at, helping the dentist and not saying a word because you really can't talk when the dentist is working. It was strange. I was the only Puerto Rican in the whole class in the whole class. But you know, and then there was another girl that she didn't, she was Puerto Rican, but she didn't say she was, she would say she was Spaniard. She said, I'm from Spain. And I would say, what part of Spain? I was like, she ain't from Spain. But I guess she felt funny. She felt funny. She said, you know, and she felt funny about around whites. So she said she was Spaniard. She wouldn't say she was Puerto Rican. So I never had that complex, you know, so I, I got along fine with everybody and graduated from that program and worked and was bored to death. I said, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, nah. I want to do, I want to talk to kids. I want to work with young people or teach or do something, you know, that has to do with my past. And I thought about, I would like to work in Spafford since it's a juvenile correctional facility. And so I went to Manhattan Community College, took up mental health, then went to Lehman, took up social work. I live in this community. I live right across the street from Castilla Maria. I feel very close to the children and the adults that come here. Casita Maria stands for a house, so this is more like a family, okay? We try to make it like a family community center. You know, people laugh sometimes when you tell them, you know, all I needed was somebody to care. And they're like, yeah, somebody to care. How many times I told you I love you? That's not, that's not the type of caring that, that you're looking for. Our parents, I know his, his mother and my mother, because my mother was a single parent too, and it was hard for them to deal with us. I had a hard time trying to deal with my kids. I didn't, I just, it's just that because I went through these hard knocks, I've learned and I've promised myself that I would not do this with my children. Although, if one of my children decides to join a gang, I can understand why. I won't be happy about it and I try to talk them out of it, but I can understand why. Everybody believes that the gangs are all gone. They're not all gone. It's just before it was gangs, cliques, whatever you want to consider us at that time. Now they're posses. Before we used to have our own lifestyle, our own dress style, and our own code. Now they go out there and they dress real nice. You know, they get these expensive coats. You know, if they can't get it, they'll go take it off somebody else. What they do now is that they rip you off for your goose. That's it, you just took the jacket. Yeah, right? you got like a nice trench or something. If it's brand new, they'll just take it. They just take your trench. One time they were going to try to take a dollar or some money off of him, and he told me, I had a bat. I go down with a bat. What you asking my son for a dollar? What, you going to hit my son? You're Simpson, he's from here too, and he's been here too, and I've been here. And so, you know, you can't be nice with them. Why they didn't do nothing? Because not only China went down with a bat, and I said, let me tell you something. I've been in jail before, so if you fuck with my son, I'm going to break your face with this bat. Your mother, your grandmother, the whole family. And I got nasty with them, and they were like, oh, my God. If they have problems with another posse, they could go over there. They could take TOD over there and then fight them. When you're done with TOD, you get a spray can, and, you know, you, you tag up and all this, and you, you know, you get faint. 
with people, you know, because you write your names on the wall a lot of times, you know, and, and a lot of people see them, they'll know, you know, like, when it's TOD, they'll know from where we're coming from. The mighty bronze. This is a hangout. This is a place with all the thoughts. Why did you form a posse to begin with? Yeah, we got tired of all this stuff, well, no. you know, pushing know, us know, around. So we just said. So we just made a posse, you know. We just gathered around. Well, well, in order to get in it, you gotta get beat up. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that. Then you be down. You know, instead of taking it out and fighting, you do it by games, you know, yeah, by, by having, you know, a little, well, yo, man, we meet you in the handball court or in the basketball court or we'll do this. You know, that's how you do it, man. Because you don't know what's out there. They might come over here, you might end up in the hospital. Or you might do something to one of them and then what? You're gonna end up in jail doing what? Time. Uh -huh. Well, I think now it's worse because they'll go upstairs and get their guns and you could even end up, you know, in a funeral. What, what kind of guns are you talking about? Like nines, automatic, automatic, 35, 35, 35 shotguns, 25, 25, 25, 25, double barrels, double barrels. If a guy, he got your sneakers, and you step on him right away, he want to kill you. Yeah. See, what you got here is two different posses, just, you know, two blocks away. Now, if we can get these two groups together, then what's to say that we can get the other groups together? Maybe, you know, if we show the other blocks and everybody else that we're doing something about it, and if you want to participate, you got to bury the hatchet. We got to show them that we're here to do something for ourselves, not kill each other off. These were very bright young people who, if born into other families, could have been senators, congressmen, and community leaders. Instead, that energy was taken into the streets. When I went back to the Bronx, it was so wonderful to see my old friends and to see their personal achievements, despite the difficulties of youthful lives within poverty and violence and limited opportunities to achieve educational potential and work that is satisfying. It doesn't feel like the end of life as long as people have begun to empower themselves. I see attitudes of empowerment and I know things have changed. Ex-gang members that have run into it's very interesting, but most of them when I talk to them, they're either social workers, they either work in a drug rehabilitation program, they either work in a school, they either work in counseling. I think about basically, they're still within the community as, as social workers. I'm doing my internship now at uh, Bronx Lebanon and I'm working with people with AIDS. Sometimes we look at our life and say, you know, gee, I've lived a rotten life or I've been dealt, you know, uh, a raw deal. But maybe it was given to me so that I can give something back, so that I can be somebody in this world that will be able to deal with those, you know, who are either going through or have been through what I've been through. If it goes and people get into a majority and they go in masses, it will be changed because anything, you can change anything you want if you want it bad enough. Two, four, six, eight. We the parents will not wait. Y dice él que la prensa puede entrar hasta el primer piso nada más porque el meeting va a ser este privado. We came here to see the Chancellor, who did not see us. He, uh, in turn, sent us a representative from his office. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Fernandez, as I heard, while we were upstairs, it was a group of six, while we were upstairs talking to the uh, representative, he sneaked out the side door. So that goes to show you how our Latin representatives uh, deal with their Latin constituents.
Ever since we broke up the TOD, like uh, some of you, we were down with TOD. Since we broke up, it's been hard for us. Like, people look trouble for us. And since we don't have no more TOD, well, we can't find nobody to help us or to watch our backs. It broke up because a lot of problems used to go to the press of the TOD. That's big blue. So slowly by slowly, he was dropping people because there's too many problems out in the street and he don't want none of us to get hurt. The summer, you could stay out late and your friends be out there and they could, if anything, protect you. But if you're outside, you know, on your own in the winter, somebody could come, you know, rob you, beat you up, or even stick you up, put a gun to your head nowadays, you know? Little kids with guns and, you know, like having wars against other people, killing each other. You know, in memory of Black Benji, for the things that the young brother did, it would be nice, man, if somebody out there, you know, if we can just get together and get a building, and get a building, put all the energies of guys like... We're all ex-gang members. Right. And we can help have those kids out in the community. Maybe we can get them back into school, get, a, get the education that we didn't get, you know, and have a man do better than what we're doing. We can show the kids, we are like flashlights. We show you the way. Don't go to that side, brother. This is the way. We've been there before. We're preparing you for a better future. You don't need to go back there. You don't need to hire teachers from California. You don't need to hire teachers from uh, way out yonder. You got them right here. I want people to say the Ghetto Bros has done something. I want my child to say when he grows up, well, my father's done something for society. See? And I want things to change, man, because I don't want to be living in the South Bronx where everything is messed up. I don't want my son to be walking in glass streets. I don't want him to live in a building that's all messed up in the ghettos. I want him to live in a good environment.